Good morning and uh, welcome to Inspiring Conversations with me, Ekta Bajaj. Uh, I'm the co-founder of Author in Me and the author of the book, uh, The Voice of Kali. Mm -hmm. And I'm extremely, extremely happy that for today's topic, especially, so the topic that we're going to be talking about is introducing spirituality to children in a very practical way. And I'm extremely fortunate that for today's topic, I have an extremely beautiful mother and woman and some I want to deeply aspire, admire, and have huge respect in my heart for. So I'm very glad that Kishori Jani could join me today for this podcast. Thank you, Kishori, uh, for joining me. And um, before I let you introduce yourself, I just want to introduce this whole um, reason why we are doing this. Now, I believe that spiritual growth is as important as emotional, mental, and physical growth of a child. And to think of as parents, what is our main intent behind raising a child? It is to um, raise a child so that the child has attained the maximum potential of whatever they were meant to do in life. And in doing so, we are giving them the wisdom to make the right choices. Now, where so much focus is done on knowledge assimilation, where we are telling them, read this, learn that, we are probably not putting so much focus on the wisdom to apply that knowledge at the right time and at the right place. And I believe that wisdom comes from spiritual concepts. Mm -hmm. So I today want to very, very subtle way touch base on this concept of spiritual parenting. Why we must introduce these concepts of spirituality to children, why we must introduce them to this self-awareness because I believe that once we introduce that, love, tolerance, focus, courage, um, respect are just byproducts. Kishori, mm -hmm. again, thank you so much. And uh, please uh, do introduce yourself to our listeners. Oh, my goodness. Thank you so much, Ekta. I really am um, honored and uh, very grateful to be here with you. Uh, all of our conversations have been so yes. uh, heartwarming and deep and very nourishing. So I really appreciate you as a person and all of your efforts that um, you've been doing for so long to really bring out that wisdom and uh, those tools for everyone. So I truly <laughs> wanted to thank you for your efforts. Uh, I am Kishori Jani. I'm a mother of four and uh, originally born and raised in India. My mother is American. My father is Gujarati. And they were both, uh, you know, priests. They uh, both joined the Hare Krishna movement in America. If you've heard of the Hare Krishna, yes. the ISKCON movement. Um, so when Srila Prabhupada, the founder, Acharya, was in America in 69, 70s, my father had gone there on um, a work visa, I guess, and he was a civil engineer uh, in Chicago working. Uh, or was it Detroit? I think it was Detroit. <laughs> Uh, and, and so he met Srila Prabhupada, who, you know, really revived the sense of um, this, this almost a little bit of, of reawakening. Although my father was already a Brahmin, born mm -hmm. uh, Gujarati Brahmin, he, you know, um, the, the, the motto in the 60s and 70s was, uh, what is it, eat, uh, eat, dance and be merry. Yes. Yes, <laughs> very much, very much this, uh, and, and that vibe had reached India with full force. So although he was a Brahmin, he just wanted to, you know, be successful, make a lot of money and be merry, be happy in life. But when he met Srila Prabhupada's guru, he, he was just completely uh, overwhelmed with wow. the depth of that wisdom that is already his birthright in one sense, the Bhagavad Gita and the teachings of the, these ancient teachings of the Vedas. Uh, and I, I think once you go to a place like America and after a couple of months or years, you, it's already a dawning on us. I lived in America for almost a decade. It starts dawning on you that there's more to life than just, <laughs> you know, eating, dancing and being merry. Uh, there's, it's not enough to have material um, possessions and accolades and uh, successes so he was completely 
transformed after that meeting with his guru. Yeah. And he met my mother there and uh, my mother had the same experience. She was born and raised a Catholic from a very well-to-do family. And she had so many questions of, you know, why am I not happy? I have everything. Her parents were wealthy. She had a good education. She was beautiful, meaning like many privileges of life that we take for granted in some sense. Yes. Or we were hankering for, and we think that that's going to be the solution in life, right? We think that if we have um, a great degree and wealth, and then we'll be happy. But she had all of that, and so did my father in some sense. And they realized it's not what is the source of our joy. Mm. Source of our joy is something else. And that that when that awakening happens to, and that searching begins. Uh, I think that's the start of any spiritual journey. And so they, they both met, uh, separately met their guru, Srila Prabhupada, and then they met each other and got married. And my mother moved to India almost 50 years ago. Wow. Yeah, she moved up, to India. She moved to India because my father was then um, uh, asked by his guru to go back to India and start helping with the mission of spreading Sanatana Dharma, mm. spreading this knowledge because it truly is the need of the hour. You know, um, I know we were discussing this, that why do we need a spiritual practice? It, it, without it, we're really empty. We're, yes. there's, no, there's no chance of truly being fulfilled in a, in a meaningful way without a spiritual practice. So, uh, you know, Srila Prabhupada, that was his goal. He wanted, he wanted, you can see that people are suffering and he just wanted to help. He was like, okay, we've got the tools. Here they are. Let's spread the message of love and um, spirit um, throughout the world. So he sent my father back to India and said, "You should preach in Gujarat. You know, you're you're someone who's gone to America and decided that something is higher than that. Maybe they'll listen to you." So he came back to India, married man. After they'd gotten married, my parents got married in in Los Angeles, and um, they basically started the Hare Krishna movement in Gujarat. Wow. So, um, you know, set up temples <clears throat> all over the state. And uh, so I was born into the Hare Krishna movement. I actually grew up in a temple setting with my parents were full-time missionaries, you know, in that sense, like really trying to get the word out, get the word of the Bhagavad Gita out. Um, and so uh, that's a, not a very brief uh, <laughs> intro to myself, but uh, in short, I... You know, I've, I've done a run around. I, I went to America to do my uh, degree and study biochemistry and worked for a couple of years. And then I had a similar uh, realization because I was born and raised very mm. sheltered in India, very much <clears throat> like, OK, this is uh, the, you know, our wisdom. This is our path. But then you always want to you question, OK, well, what is what else is out there? OK, I, I know the message of the Gita but I just want to have a good time. <laughs> I do want to eat, dance and be merry. And, and maybe that, that is true. Maybe they're trying to, you know, maybe they're hiding something from me. They're, maybe they're trying to, you know, you have all these doubts. Yes. In your mind. So <laughs> my own journey has been to kind of, you know, move away from the, the spiritual path and just try living the American dream. I went to college there, partied wow. and all, for the first time in my life, you know, it was all of new experience, but, for 10 years, I lived that, that uh, life in Los Angeles. It was very um, exciting, very fun at times. Uh, and yet, slowly, slowly, it starts dawning. Wow. You know, deep inside, you know that there's something more. There's something more than the externals. In a, in a society that is so technologically advanced, we've got so many resources at our fingertips, literally. Connection, you know, we're connected socially social media wise but we're not connected with ourselves with our true innate um, reality so, so mm. our external reality is very glamorous but the internal reality it's um truly like a bird in a cage you know we're just we're not really feeding the bird we kind of made the cage out of yes. diamonds and beautiful uh, gadgets and very smart cage we live in <laughs> that's so true <laughs> so true right so uh in a nutshell i i had i'm i consider myself like a born again uh 
you know, Hindu Vaishnav, because I, you know, I tried to shed all of that and find myself again. That you know, is I was like, so okay. interesting. So, yeah. so interesting. But the, you know, they say that and it's also written in our Vedas um, and in all, I think in all Asian philosophies that mm -hmm. um, the first six years of a child's life kind of lay the foundation of who they will ultimately become or what yeah. they will ultimately become. So yeah. certainly the seed of spirituality was embedded in your heart yeah. by your parents when you were young and you went to America, you tried to deviate from what you were living and then you came back. Yeah. Because something called, was calling you. Absolutely. The, the Sanskrit term is sanskaras. I'm also a part-time Sanskrit teacher. So yes, you are my I, Sanskrit teacher. And no one knows. <laughs> <laughs> That's Aww. where the journey started from. <laughs> yes, yes. What, a, what a mystical way, you know, <laughs> the Lord has mystical ways. But um, because my father uh -huh. was pretty much a Sanskrit scholar and I, I, you know, I heard him recite verses from the Gita and the Bhagavad and all the, the Puranas my whole life. So Sanskrit was kind of like a second language to me. Not that I spoke it or anything, but I, it goes in like what you're saying about these uh, childhood impressions. Mm. The Sanskrit term is samskaras. Right? So even in Hindi, you've got the term samskaras. Yes. Because um, those impressions during the first six years or even beyond until even in our youth, growing up there they're, they're lifelong yes they're, they're, they last for a life and um now i think the world is really awakening to the idea that it is absolutely not just essential but necessary to be really looking after our next generation during that crucial developmental stage of a, of a child you know i think before maybe there's some maybe ignorance about well, if they spend the whole day at nursery or, you know, they'll just get on with it. We just need to teach them the math, English, science and the usual curriculum. But that is just so uh, such a basic level of understanding because that is not what a child mm -hmm. needs at that age. Mm -hmm. child, I, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that, that's what I was coming to that. Uh, we, we started by focusing on what subjects they need to learn. And in fact, in fact, in ancient times, we started with the holistic development. And then as we moved on in life, we, we started to focus on the subject matter. And then we thought, no, there is something missing. We need emotional connect too. And we started focusing on emotional intelligence. Then we started moving on mental health. But I think the next way forward is coming down to the circle and talking about spirituality in a very um liberal way in a very simple way okay. mm. am i echoing <laughs> I, I can hear you fine am okay. i echoing no 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 <laughs> okay so <clears throat> coming back to what we were so understanding these okay. concepts are not easy i mean look at looking at your journey i'm sure the seed of curiosity was laid in your heart while you were growing up and if you can remember any incident that may have triggered that, that knowledge that something bigger is, or I'm beyond who I am. I, I would love to hear that from you. But what, that, that seed of knowledge is, or curiosity is from where we stem out, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And while we are, we are telling children that, yes, your curiosity can lead you to inventions, isn't it important to tell them that curiosity will also lead to self-discovery? of knowing who we are. So tell me more about this. When was that seed? When did you recognize the seed of curiosity when you were growing up? And uh, how do you try to introduce that to ch your own children? Because you have got four kids. Yeah, great question, really. Um, so I would say that I had, it wasn't in my childhood so much because because I was born into it and it was already a set up routine in our family, all the spiritual practices you could imagine, waking up early in the morning, eating very sattvic food, vegetarian food only. Uh, we didn't grow up with a TV. I'd never watched TV growing really? up at all. Yeah, yeah. Um, and <clears throat> just doing a lot of like seva around the temple with people, meeting people, you know, sharing 
um, deep philosophical conversations on a regular basis. That was just standard. So because of that, uh, I think in childhood, growing up maybe like 16, 17, then I started thinking, well, what else is out there? So my curiosity was of the opposite nature that, okay, well, what does it mean to just, you know, maybe ah. use, your, use your free will in a different way? You know, um, because we all have free will, right? That's the whole uh, conundrum, how to use to, your free will, how to make good choices. So I came full circle maybe in my early 20s after, after I went to America and um, went to college, worked for a while, lived the American dream as such. And then, so my spiritual reawakening, like a mm. second birth as such was while I was in America working, I was working very hard, two jobs, going through a really reputed college. So it was difficult to, I to put in the hours and um, studying biochemistry was not easy. No. So I, you know, I was fully immersed in that material dream as such. And it, um, at that point, looking around, I had two jobs, right? So one of my bosses, um, I was a lab manager, like a supervisor, and she, she was a very well um, established and accomplished uh, researcher. And I could, she, you know, a little bit elderly and everywhere I looked, this was a very similar story that elder people were actually struggling, not just emotionally, mentally, physically. She had uh, gone through a whole round of cancer and uh, you could tell she was in a lot of stress because trying to get grants and living this really fast paced lifestyle. Uh, and it's not a one off anecdotal story. This is this is this is pretty much becoming a standard theme that yes. when I looked around me, the elders in that society were struggling. So to me, as a younger person, I was like, well, what is the proof that a society is doing well? You know, I, I was questioning myself, like, what, what's, what's life going to be for me 20, 30 years later? Um, and, and, and the realization dawned on me that uh, this fast paced life that we're just we're not really sure where we're going, but we're going somewhere really fast. We're making a lot of money and we're, you know, doing, we're, we're in this passionate rajasic mode of existence that we just got to create. We've got to be successful. We've got to uh, be acknowledged and um, respected and, all these things that are very rajasic in nature, it's, it's leading to a lot of mental instability, actually. This, this whole mm -hmm. real pandemic is a mental health pandemic. If we really get to the root of it, sure, you know, we've got COVID and all that, but um, the, 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 if we peel the layers, it's uh, the war is within, you know, this, this, that we really have to, come to terms, face the reality that, that um, we don't really have the tools for, for fixing the inner reality. We don't have the tools or we're not practicing them. We've, we've figured out everything to control the externals, but within there is just a lot of turmoil and um, confusion and um, just helplessness in most people, most people that I come across. And yes. yeah, you know, it's a... <laughs> So, so, so coming back to the point that my reawakening to the spiritual path, luckily, because of the samskaras that we talked about earlier, I was able to, you know, decipher what, what do I really want? Ask, you know, myself maybe a little bit earlier than other people would. Mm. What am I doing? What, what is the purpose of this? And let's reassess the long-term goals. Uh, do I want to end up maybe really unhealthy or sick because I'm living such a stressed out life or such a fast paced life. Or do I want to, you know, with, with the erosion of family values, many people are alone because the materialistic capitalistic agenda is you first. Yes. <laughs> Me first and then everyone else. And that, that inevitably can also lead to a lot of lonely people, successful, but lonely people who don't have, again, the tools, the spiritual tools, how to, stay connected, integrated, live their dharma and, you know, serve each other. Those, those values are not really taught. So um, I like what you said earlier about the values, you know, we're teaching kindness, love, patience, because 
we want to assess and address our mental health. But all of it, you know, it's not separate. No. Spiritual path is not separate from our mental health path. Because once we've got a deep connection with who we are, we understand what our goal is and the, uh, the, um, the bigger vision, then everything else starts falling into place. It's like a jigsaw puzzle where if you start with, you know, either you start in the middle or you start in the corners and then everything just starts falling mm. into place because you've got the bigger picture. You've got the bigger spiritual vision that we're here to truly serve each other. And that in that way, we serve ourselves <laughs> in the bigger scheme. Wow. So, I mean, clearly, I mean, what you said, it's, it's so, so deep and beautiful. I mean, so many adults will grow up as a depressed person because they absolutely have no idea how to handle the situations around them. And that's why self-help books are selling the fastest. And, and, and there is so much surge in um, the demand for it. But uh, coming back to children, and, you know, you have four beautiful kids. Now, when you were growing up, of course, you had the, I would say the bliss, uh, the good fortune that you were born in a family that was already embracing spirituality in a very beautiful way. So, so in a way that was there already. But when you, when you were expecting your first child, what was it going in your mind? How did you think you're going to raise your child? Uh, will you let him explore his own spiritual you know horizons or will you guide because it's it's a question of how do you introduce this concept to your children yes very relevant question and i really like how you phrased it but you know will we just guide or will we allow them to explore on their own so my understanding and i really from my own experience as well not just the vedic perspective but even i can say from my own experience of how i grew up I am a firm believer that, that during the formative years, along with the love and the patience and the nurturing, this idea of discipline, self-discipline, not, not an external physical disciplining where you punish and not, not, not like this uh, intense um, punishing discipline, but just the idea of self-discipline is extremely important where the child learns through example, mm. in the Bhagavad Gita, there's this very fa- famous uh, verse where Lord Krishna is describing how we learn and how people follow. People follow through example. They, they lead, they, uh, the, the leaders, they're leading uh, through example. It's not about what we say so much with children. It's, I, I could tell the child, I love you very much. I, you know, you are very special and you're going to do g- great things. That's nice. Those are, you know, we have these positive affirmations and yes, we need to hear loving words, but actually, actually the child is learning through example from what he's seen, uh, what they see and what they experience as a whole person is the greatest teacher. So therefore, Krishna highlights that if you want to teach someone something, you've got to live it. You've got to be living it. The, and, and then the child just follows without even, you don't even have to raise your voice. You don't even have to tell them mm-hmm. that you're special because they will understand through your actions that I'm special. When the mother cooks or the father cooks, when, when the child is well fed, well looked after, it, he, he or she knows I'm loved. They know I'm special. They, they just know from within because of the energy. It's a connection of spirit. It's not a connection of material words or things. The child doesn't just need, of course, they need clothes and food, but that is just the basic level. That is yes. not the true need. Anyone can give a child clothes and food and shelter, but that's not what the child truly requires for a wholesome development so I think the greatest loss I really feel is when I meet parents um, is from my because I had that experience of a spiritual connection with my parents even though externally it wasn't you know materially speaking we didn't have I, I remember going to school without shoes on one time because I just didn't have 
shoes. <laughs> so <laughs> materially speaking, we were not, we didn't have much, but I don't remember a day in my life where I felt uh, like I lacked. Not a day in my life did I feel the sense of lacking in me, mm. even though I didn't have material things. Wow. So that to me was extremely profound, but it has very little to do with things. So as a parent, the greatest thing we can do to our children is give them our time and be positive spiritual examples because everything else they're going to learn. They're going to learn math, English, geography, politics from somebody else. They don't need us for that. You know, it helps if you're educated. Your child will probably be more educated. <laughs> but their deepest need is for us to connect with them soul to soul, spirit to spirit level, and pass on that positive example, this, this powerful, empowering um, role model by living a healthy lifestyle ourselves, not just physically healthy, but mentally, spiritually balanced lifestyle where, where they don't see the, the parents fighting all the time and shouting and um, feeling a sense of lacking. If the parents, if we as parents are angry and having the sense of lack having the sense of um, fear and anxiety all the time, that's what we're passing on to our children. It's the spirit that is getting passed on, like the spiritual connection. So um, my approach on parenthood has, is literally, you know, you asked me, what was the feeling of when I got pregnant for the first time? It was a deep sense of panic because I was like, Oh, oh my gosh, oh Krishna, I have to get my act together now. What it means, yes. it doesn't mean, oh, I have to get the money together, oh, I have to get the house together. Those are all nice to have. But the most important thing that we can get together for our children in ourselves is our consciousness, mm -hmm. is the way we live life. If we can sort that out, sort out our baggage from the past, you know, deal with our trauma before we have children so we don't pass on that trauma yes. because we're passing on trauma without realizing it. We've, we've brought anxiety and fears and insecurity and anger and hatred and all this stuff from our, whatever we brought, that's what's going to get passed on in our daily interactions. It won't be the clothes and the money and the food and all that. Maybe, I mean, if you're a trust fund child, maybe you'll pass that on too, but very few children that will actually be looking to pass that on. It's the, mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the emotional balance, the conscious levels that is going to be passed on through generations. So for any parent that's listening to this, uh, if you want to feel empowered, I would say the most important thing would be to figure out our own spiritual journey and to um, unburden ourselves from our trauma before having children because that can be the greatest gift that we pass to them wow i'm i'm totally in awe of what you said because i completely believe it and and you you kind of said it in a, such a simple way mm. the concept of of uh, of self observation mm. that that uh, you know that what am Am I, am I in the right place of mind? And am I in the right uh, frame of mind to have a child? And the responsibility, like you said, you, you went into a panic. It was probably that feeling responsible for raising and giving birth and raising this child to so that the child is, is brought up in the best way possible and it just so connects because that's what we do. And, um, you know, I, I look at social media and I see these very uh, random funny videos of <laughs> parents and, and moms showing how hectic their lives are, how they're managing everything. And they obviously saying it in a sense of, with a sense of humor, but I sometimes think, why are we projecting on whatever is, you know, the panic, the chaos and whatever, there is, there is a beauty in that chaos. There is, uh, there is harmony in that, uh, you know, the chaos that we are there and, and many people would, would want that chaos. So I, I, I get where you're coming from and that's absolutely well said. But uh, again, um, 
these concepts again, what can we do? What can we do when we have children to introduce children to these concepts in a very simple way? What do you do? What's your routine like? Because your children obviously are so beautifully being raised. You're, you're raising them in this most beautiful way. They raise their such well man, beautiful children. And, and, and I'm sure when they'll grow up, they'll only thank you. They'll have full, their hearts will be full of gratitude for what you're giving them. But what do you do in your basic? Do you do you, do you recite something? Do you ask them to say something? Mm. As a parent, simple, simple things. Right. So I, I appreciate you saying that it's it's true. There's so much chaos in parenthood. There's there's no um, I wouldn't there's no one size fits all because so many people, you know, it's just such a unique experience, a unique set of circumstances that we bring to the table as parents and as the child that you bring in can be very challenging sometimes. It can be very straightforward sometimes. But um, I I will go back to the to the point earlier that after the initial panic when I got pregnant uh, and realizing that I, now I can't fake it, whatever I am, I was like, Kishori, whatever you are, you're going to pass that on to the next person, this person coming in. So really straighten out, you know, the issues. Let's, let's, let's really work on being the best version of who I am. So, so from that, what does it then translate in a daily um, routine that can be something that we'd have to figure out for yourself. Each parent would have to go through that self-reflection and, and that journey to, and hence that spiritual practice is so essential because we must figure out what is that baggage we're carrying. Everyone has their own baggage. And how can I best avoid that to pass on to the next generation? Personally, I find uh, certain uh, routines extremely uh, important and very simple things like in the morning um, you know it's very chaotic getting everybody ready for school and there's a lot of screaming I can't find my socks I can't and it's crying and <laughs> fighting and no that's my bottle and there's a lot of um, chaos and one I'm going to digress here really quickly but the beauty of chaos in a loving set setting obviously in a in a in a so-called balanced way with family is that actually it really draws out um, different levels of truth. Meaning when I see the children behave like this, I have to really focus and be in the now. I, I cannot, I, I've become like the Zen master of figuring out, even in all the shouting and screaming, what is important? Because you're just focus. Don't get sidetracked by all this other chaos that's happening. So it's interesting that in any situation, we can still have a spiritual consciousness. We can, if we want to. So my, I guess my point is just because there's chaos and there's a lot of uncontrollable variables in our life, it doesn't mean that we have to sort that out before we do the spiritual practice. I think many people think that, well, once I have a house or once my job is sorted or once my, this relationship is sorted, then I'll be peaceful enough to start the spiritual journey. Then I can do some self-awareness, um, some work on myself. But actually, it's the opposite. <laughs> dharma, dharma, according to you know the Vedic concept that whatever situation we are in, that is our dharma. And if we just make slight changes, like you're saying, like you add little, uh, you know, practices every day, then actually. Um, it's almost like a, like a catalyst to pull out the best in you. The chaos is almost the catalyst to really draw out what um, needs work on. You know, like I have a short fuse. Like I get really, uh, you know, worked up sometimes. And I'm like, okay. No, it doesn't you know, seem so. <laughs> oh, that's what I want to, that's what I'm sharing. to believe. <laughs> no, no, no. Like I, I can lose it. You know? so I, I, I'm just sharing that because it's, it happens and that it, consciously I have to really work on it on a daily basis that I don't pass that on to my children. You know, I got it from my parents, like them being so busy and there's a lot of lot to do a lot on their plate. So even, even if you have a spiritual practice, you still have work to do on yourself every single day. That is the beauty of it. And the chaos can actually help 
it can help catalyze, you know, yeah, catalyze that growth, that spiritual growth. But the beauty of dharma is not, not waiting for externals to change. Just doing your duty, doing your duty the best of your ability, and then the transformation happens. Like it's a magic that happens because we are not the doers, you know, according to the Bhagavad Gita. We are recipients of grace in our life, and that's when the change happens. We, you know, we may think, well, I'm going to control the situation in this way and that way. That's just the ego speaking that I'm going to change. I'm going to be this person. I'm going to be empowered. I'm going to be changing the world. I'm going to be truthful. And then when we get pressed and squeezed, it all just crumbles. The reality is just surrendering to our dharma, surrendering to what my duty is as a mother, surrendering in that chaos and just and, and still focusing on the spiritual uh, vision or goal that we have that we really want to just pass on love to the children. We want to empower them. Um, and while we do that, the transformation is already happening because again, we're not the doers. We're only recipients of, of um, help, spiritual grace that, that comes into our lives and, and yes. um, we just have to move out of the way in a way and just allow that to manifest. Beautiful. So answering your question, what do I do on a daily basis? I digress there a bit. Um, in the morning, I put on prayers. Just on YouTube, I have a playlist, my morning meditation. So as soon as we, you know, it's like our, our alarm goes off and it just, all the chants come out, the Vishnu Sahasranam, there's all these Sanskrit mantras because I'm a firm believer of Sanskrit chants having yes. a very deep, deep um you know transformative vibration we can't even understand how it's happening so that's my choice in the morning for a good hour we just allow those chants to go on while we're getting ourselves together um and then you know that's one basic thing then during the day obviously we have our own personal jump and um meditation chanting meditation that we do personally but when the kids are back in the evening, we all do an arti together, which is wow. where, um, you know, we, we recognize <laughs> the supreme being in our life and we give gratitude. That's what arti is. It's just inviting auspiciousness by being mindful and present as a family and um, offering ourselves back to that, you know, divine force, God, whatever you want to call it. We are, we worship Krishna. And, and then that, that, connection is established you know because we're showing the children through practice what it means to express gratitude gratitude is not just a feeling and an emotion it you know it starts off like that but gratitude it manifests in action mm -hmm. and if it's not manifesting in action it can't truly sustain over time because some things will change and then the same thing that you had gratitude for, then now you have resentment for. So unless we're acting on the gratitude, unless we're doing something physically, some action on a daily basis, if you, you know, if you have gratitude for your parents, then on a daily basis, something small, whether you feed them, whether you, you know, figure out their computer for them, you, you've got to do something for them, for your loved one. It's not enough to just tell your child you love them. Yes. That, that, that has to come through action. That has to, how much time do you spend with them? How much do you listen to them? How much are you truly allowing them to be a part of your life without controlling it? You know, how much are we allowing the other? So again, with God, this arti is a really special time for the child to, to um, practice how to express that gratitude and how to ask for help. That's another thing we don't teach mm. in day and age. We don't teach how to pray because we think, well, why should we pray? We should just work hard and get whatever we deserve. You know, everyone yes. just rely on your own hands and legs and ability. That's great. But we're missing out on a huge chunk of mystery and magic there. Like when we ask, yes. when we teach the child to ask for help because the cosmos is <laughs> unlimited. God is unlimited. He, you know, just by a small act of prayer, it's so profound, you know, like the, so these things, if you don't feel it, you're not going to pass it on. Mm. Therefore, we have to really kind of find ourselves in our faith. Because for Hindu, we've got to truly 
whatever you are, Christian, Hindu, Muslim, you've got to find that faith within. And then, then you'll find ways to pass it on to the child. For me, it's arti, for me, it's shlokas. Then we read together, we read Bhagavad regularly with the children. Even if they don't understand too much of it, you'll see over time, they start thinking differently. Yes. Their mind and consciousness is completely transformed where they, uh, it's a subtle thing. You might think, well, they're not really listening and they're not, you know, it's not such a deep concept, such a subtle concept. But from my own experience of me growing up and hearing it all, maybe not really comprehending it, but later on in life, when, when you need that wisdom, somehow it manifests. All of a sudden you're like, oh, I remember that. I remember yes. that story. I remember that that one example I heard where instead of reacting with hatred and anger, the story talks about how this person reacted with so much humility and love. And you're like, oh, yeah, you know, it all comes together in a way that we cannot really calculate beforehand. Yes. So those are three basic things that I would, you know, some meditation personal meditation time where you actually transform the vibration all around us like the house the ambience you can just feel it when i'm playing those mantras and i'm singing the mantras it's completely powerfully transformative then the the mutual expression of gratitude gratitude yeah where there's a singing in it and the kids are all involved with musical instruments and that's a really a wholesome experience you know it's a very all the senses are involved. The boys are playing Mridanga and Kartal and we're singing and there's dancing and there's fighting and there's crying. And, but they all know that it's Arti time and we express gratitude. We, we sing and praise the Lord Krishna and we ask for help. And then actually building on our knowledge base by reading what is, what is the philosophy? What is, why are we here? Answering those questions. And so those are three things that I can just say that if, if you're looking to maybe start something today, they're very easy to do. There's so much on YouTube. Yes. There's so much that it's not like you, it doesn't like cost money. Maybe, you know, 10 minute arti. You don't have to do that. You can do something else. But 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there. It's baby steps, really. But with children, there's no question of passing something on unless we are doing it. That's the bottom line. Beautiful. And, and so, so beautiful said again. But, you know, for anyone they, who, who probably is not able to understand Arti or anything, it's mm. something similar to start with the, the day with positive vibrations. You could just mm. play any music that has some positive mm. vibrations. But of course, mantras are mm. way apart. And then I love the fact that you just said collective gratitude. Mm. Because we often tell children to do your gratitudes, say gratitude, say gratitude. But when we are doing it, it, mm. it creates a different impression. I mean, it's a collective exercise. As a family, you're involved in it. And of course, uh, knowledge and contemplation. Because I remember when I was growing up, my father, he used to tell us lots of stories. Every dining um, dinner time was full of stories, um, simple things that he did at work. And he would ask us to talk about it. And he would tell us how he dealt with a certain situation because he... Uh, he's a very practical man and he, he yeah. followed uh, Bhagavad Gita a lot. Mm -hmm. But he would tell us how it, he applied that in his life. And at that time, I thought them as wonderful, beautifully narrated stories. But yeah. now they just come back to me like lessons and wisdom. Mm -hmm. So the, the power of contemplation and uh, three beautiful steps that you've given us. Uh, it's been uh, it's been so amazing speaking to you, Shuri, but uh, we, we probably have... Uh, time limitation today but uh, probably another one in near future <laughs> because there is so much that um, needs to be discussed on this topic there is so much that parents need need to know and especially young mothers who are struggling with this whole uh, imbalance in their mind of you know finding my time giving my time to child to, to just come in certain sense of balance that you know, this is your time to enjoy motherhood and 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 just yeah. let children grow in some beautiful spiritual beings and, and connect with your own spirituality. So thank you so much again for your wisdom. And uh, it's been deeply, deeply inspiring for me. And I'm sure for parents who are looking for something and for children uh, and, and some guidance to them to probably guide their children towards spirituality. So thank you again. 
Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's totally my pleasure. Every time we speak, I feel like time just goes without realizing. <laughs> so more next time. Yes.